a lot that he has to answer for. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the most recent uh, buildings that I'm aware that Jim had a heavy involvement with was quite justifiably shortlisted for a Sterling Prize uh, two years ago. Uh, and that's the building called the Benzie Building, which is the new building and refurbished 1960s tower uh, at the Manchester School of Art. Uh, it's a fantastic building. Had it not been for the fact that the Everyman Theatre in Liverpool was just that little bit better, um, <laughs> it would, I'm sure, uh, have won the Sterling Prize in that year. Nevertheless, a very, very justified nomination. Anyway, I, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Chapman. Good morning, everyone. I've already been given the hurry up sign before I start, which is always very good. I, too, am an immigrant. Uh, I left uh, Yorkshire and came across the power lines over 40 years ago and haven't regretted a day of doing that because this city is a great city. Um, and I think what it did over the, the sort of 40 plus years I've been here is believe in itself again. And as Phil has said, and as Claire did said in her introduction, I think the city has learned a lot in that, in that process of, of, of development. We have made mistakes, but if you don't do things, you don't make mistakes. But the city has moved forward a long way and is continuing to move forward. The city has benefited from great continuity in its leadership. It's had strong leadership from Graham Stringer through Richard Lees and Howard Bernstein. But beneath them, or within their teams, they've had great continuity as well. And that vision and that continuity, I think, has meant people have been very confident to invest in the city in all sorts of ways, both in time and in money. First shot is the, uh, I was approached by Bob Scott in the mid 80s to say, how do we make a bid for the Olympic Games? And the view was that we make the bid for the Olympic Games, I'm gonna have a shave now, make a bid for the Olympic Games using linking Manchester and Liverpool together. So we produced this model with the ship canal lit by candles showing how it could happen. Unfortunately, that vision wasn't shared by the UK Olympic team at the time and they went with Birmingham. But what it did do was it encouraged us, encouraged us then to go and say, well, how do cities really adjust themselves to meet a major festival like the Olympics? So quite a few of us were privileged to go to Barcelona and in going to Barcelona, we learned that it wasn't about the games, it was about regenerating cities. It was about linking communities. How do you actually make those things fit into a city and then leave a legacy, which, which London then chose, well, stole from us eventually about the legacy side of it. But how do you actually invest in the city which works for that festival for a very short period of time, but continues to work for the community? So we learned a lot from going to, Bar going to Barcelona. Having been to Barcelona, I then walked the city with Bob Scott, who again was very influential at this, at this stage, and Graham Stringer, looking at Manchester city centre and saying, how can we make this work in the city centre? How, let's forget Liverpool now, let's just focus on Manchester. So we produced this very simple plan with Old Trafford on the left and a uh, Manchester City, I think, on the right, but we realized how close and tight those facilities were. And if you look carefully on the, the, the northwest, southeast uh, down, you see the universities of Salford and of Manchester. And the universities have been a, such an important component in bringing all of those things together. But the, the idea was that you could produce a compact games that would have the facilities within it that would benefit the whole of the community. And the village was planned on that, that slice in the middle going out to the, the city stadium, showing that then that would be part of the residential development of, of Manchester going forward. Wait another 10 years and you see how that's worked. Phil talked about city pride. I was asked in 1994 to chair a panel by Graham Stringer to look at design quality, neighborhood development, how the residential communities could actually work within the city. And we produced this document called City Pride. We did have a lot of consultation with a wide range of people in producing that document. 
and it formed the basis of saying to people who wanted to come invest money in the city, developers, contractors, designers, if you're coming to this city, we're setting the quality quotient high up there. We're not expecting to start down here. If you come here, you've got to meet that standard before you start. Most people achieved that standard, some failed, but it, it did lift the standards for the city. Phil mentioned Cube. I chaired Cube for 10 years. It was very, very sad when we had to close it five years ago. But again, I think it served its purpose at the time. What it did do was bring the community in to talk about design. We got the schools of architecture to come in and display their work. We got developers on major schemes to come and present their, their schemes within the gallery. And it changed people's perception about what design was about and also made architects, engineers, landscape architects listen to the community of what they wanted. It's very sad. We ought to create this centre again for discussion, as Phil rightly says. But it was there, but it no longer works, unfortunately. We now use the School of Architecture for many of these things. We've got to talk about the bomb. The bomb went off. What it did do was actually make the city say, hang on, we've done all of this careful research work, we've done all this learning, traveling around the world, looking at good cities, how do they work? What do we now do? And then by launching an international competition, attracting bids from people both within Manchester and outside Manchester to come and say, look at our city, what can we now do with it, was very, very important. The, the funny, well, two, there were two funny stories that happened when the bomb went off. One, there was an old gentleman asleep in the Arndale who didn't know anything about it for three days. And when he got up, he thought, this city's changed a bit. And then the, also, at the same time, the Bridgewater Hall was being commissioned. And the team commissioning the organ were in there. And they came out after about four o'clock, having done their work. There was nobody in the city. What he did prove that the springs that Arab had designed into the base of the Bridgewater Hall worked, so the acoustics of the hall were first class. Very, very important. Another story about the Bridgewater Hall, which says something about the leadership of this city, was I, did an urban, I went to an urban design seminar in, in Belfast with Richard Lease. And, oh, no, not with Richard Lease, but found Richard Lease sitting next to me on the plane. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I've come to, I'm going to Belfast because I want to look at the concert hall because I'm told it's better than the Bridgewater Hall. And I want to look at the bus station because I'm told it's the best bus station in Europe. If you have a leader of the council who is thinking in that way, and this is a long time ago, then you're going to have a city which actually has strong leadership and a vision which can be delivered. Very important. So... We then went on and said, well, okay, we didn't win the bid to, have to host the games in, in uh, 2000, uh, sorry, in, in 1996, so let's go for 2000. So we started preparing the bid for 2000, and again, we're looking at the city centre, we're looking at how integrated it can be, how compact it can be. So we put a bid together for the Olympics for, t for 2000. Unfortunately, in Mon Monte Carlo, and you have to go to these very strange places to open the bids, it was decided that Sydney was a better offer than Manchester. But what it did do again was Manchester began to develop this coherent strategy about how we could link the city together, how we could actually make things work in a better way. So we didn't win the bid, we didn't win the games, but we carried on development. And then after the bomb, obviously, projects were beginning to complete. And I saw you all standing in Exchange Square earlier, at the end of Exchange Street, looking into Exchange Gardens, that became, into Exchange Square. That became a very important development. Martha Schwartz is coming later today. We'll talk a bit more about, I, I suppose, the development at, at, at Exchange Square. It caused quite a lot of controversy when it was finished. It became the best skateboard park in any city in the UK but it actually dealt very, very well with the great challenges that exist in that part of the city. When the Marks and Spencer's development was produced in, the, in 1970, mid-70s, you had that big drop, and there was a disconnect between the north of the city and the south of the city. With the Exchange Street and the link through St. Anne's Square, suddenly it all became one again. Well, not suddenly, but by very careful thought and use of the geometry. So that arena that Martha created there also became a great venue for events within the city. 
And one of the things that I was talking to Charles about earlier is spaces within the city, green spaces within the city, squares within the city, all need a lot of care and need a lot more work. We put a fountain in Exchange Square, which was too difficult for the city engineers to run, so they switched the computers off. Very, very sad, having invested that amount of money. But if you're going to do that and you're going to create these public spaces, somebody has to love them, somebody has to take care of them, and they have to be used intelligently. We have the same message in the next space in Piccadilly Gardens, which again was again developed by Jason Pryor, who led on the master plan for the building of the city after, after the bomb involved Roger Milgram from Arabs, involved me, and involved a Japanese architect called Tadeando, who builds in concrete. And if you go to Japan, he builds lots and lots of structures in concrete. And that concrete wall is loved and hated by 50-50% of the people. But what it did do, and what it still does do, is it separates the buses from the, from the garden space, and that's what it was meant to do. And we can have a long debate about how that garden space works, but again, we put in a very sophisticated fountain which was too complicated to use in the start. Very, very sad, but these, these things were understood at the briefing stage. But those are the sort of challenges of the discussions that I think Phil is trying to promote. But again, because of the way the city worked with Argent and when they built the office building on the side of that building, which helped fund the gardens, there's more green space there than there ever was before. That's, that is true. I mean, we've measured it very, very carefully. But when, the, when Argent took over that building, they took over the responsibility of managing the square for about two years, and it improved. But if you're going to invest in big spaces like that, somebody needs to look after them. So again, another shot, and the Ando wall. It does give that shelter, but again, the city had planned to change the way the, bus, the buses work. They still haven't done that. I know it's part of the whole Greater Manchester Transport Plan and it needs developing further. If we look at what's happening in Peter Square now, we look at the way the end of GMEX, sorry, Manchester Central, has now been developed, you can actually get these transport interchanges to be designed and work in a sensitive way. It's a beautiful green wall which covers that awful brick end at Manchester Central. So again, it can be done, but this takes time and people have to go back and revisit them. So, when we did the Commonwealth Games in 2002, uh, that was again a great success, but it built on all the investment that had been made in the early days for the planning for the Olympics. And the Commonwealth Games, and now the, all the work that's been done by Manchester City in the schools around there, the housing around there, the learning for, for sports education, is all a great investment that if you'd gone back to that area when the Olympic bids would be made in the mid-90s, you wouldn't have believed that's possible. The quality of what's there, how it invests the whole community is very, very important. And what used to be the Olympic Village is now a major part of the housing development for that area going forward. So it takes time to bring all of these things together and a great deal of care and continuity of leadership. So, I'm going to finish because I've been told I have a quarter of an hour, so I think I've done it. Um, at the moment, the city is re revisiting the design guide. It's looking very much about how residential accommodation works in a modern city. This is in a, very much in a draft stage. It's going to be discussed by a wide range of people, but again, it's how we maintain the quality going forward. And it's very, very important. It isn't just thinking about the residential spaces, it's thinking about neighborhoods. It's thinking about how healthcare can now be built into new housing communities. I wish the NHS thought about things in that, that careful way as well. But the city, again, is leading about thinking about neighborhood development. I hope there's enough there to have a conversation and we can discuss the successes and failures of the last 25 years plus. Many thanks. <laughs>